So uh, yeah, tomorrow you have an exam. Uh, it covers chapter 14 and the few sections from chapter 16 that we've seen. Uh, basically all the stuff post exam one uh, is fair game for exam two. Uh, today I have a review uh, sheet that was posted on D2L. We talked about it in Monday's class, uh, but it's just in my folder. If you if you haven't gotten this already, um, I would recommend that you download it um, and whatnot. Uh, we also went over in Monday's class, right? I had made another one of these like checklists and all this sort of stuff. There's also an announcement on D2L about uh, like there's a D2L practice exam. There are these quiz and exam revision assignments. There's lots of ways that you can be studying for the the upcoming exam. So uh, that's really the only administrative announcement. Uh, any questions before we jump into the review? All right, well, there'll be uh, plenty of time for more questions here. So why don't we start off with a couple multiple choice questions. So considering this function here, and I would like the range of this function f. So the range, uh, remember this would be uh, from 14.1, if you wanted to go back and kind of find more problems similar to this, we went over Many in class, you saw a few in the web work and whatnot. And of course, there are more problems in the textbook uh, if you want to practice ranges. So for ranges, these are the outputs of the functions. What can actually come out of the function? And so the strategy that we use for ranges that we went over in class is that you kind of look at this outside most function. In this case, we have a sine function, right? And we look at and think about what is the range for sine. And, and in our heads, right, we're probably, I'm thinking of this as just sine of u for the time being, right? We'll deal with the inside here in just a second. But if I was to think about just regular old sine, right, it kind of wiggles back and forth like this. And the outputs for sine vary between negative 1 and 1. But they'll never be any greater than 1, and they'll never be any less than negative 1. So if I was just to look at my outside function, my range is from negative one to one. Then we think a little bit about our inside function, five X minus Y. And we think, is there any additional restrictions, any values that five X minus Y cannot be? For instance, you know, if I wanted to achieve a hundred for you, right? If I wanted to get sine of you, which is a little bit of a silly thing because you get all of the, the negative ones to ones pretty fast here actually. But if I wanted to be, you know, 100 for you, could I make that happen? Well, yeah, there's many ways. I could have x be 20 and y be 0, for instance, right? Really, any number that I want you to be, uh, if I'm a little bit clever, I can figure out a way to make you that number. So there's no additional restrictions for our u in this case. And so, therefore, the outputs are going to be from negative 1 to 1. There are no additional restrictions. Cases where you did see additional restrictions, we saw one in class, for instance, where we had things like the natural log of four minus x squared minus y squared, right? And if you consider this first, just like we did in the, our case, and you break this up into the outermost function and then looking at the inner function, right? When you look at the inner function, there's no way, no matter what real values you plug in for x and for y, there's no way that you're ever plugging in something for u that's bigger than four, right? The maximum output for u in this case is four because you're subtracting away squareds. Right? So this would be a case where the U would have some additional restriction. And so we have seen cases like that, uh, of course, in class and in the web work homework and whatnot. So that's just, again, kind of a reminder of when the inside could have some additional restriction here. All right. So that's the, the first question. Any questions on ranges? Uh, yes, here in the middle. Ah, so yeah, in, in our good old classical algebra days, when there were just x's and y's, right, the y's were absolutely the ranges because those were the outputs, right? We always outputted a y value, and your input, your domain, was an x value. But it's true here in Calculus 3, now that we've upgraded our algebra to some extent, right, the inputs are x's and y values. So now that makes up our domain, and our outputs are z values. So quite often in Calculus 3, our outputs would be a z value for the range. We haven't really dealt with it so much in our class here, but it is very possible that, you know, if we had a situation where a function of x's, y's, and z's, and maybe this 
output was a W, right? Now the range would be a W value, right? Because Z is an input. So it's really the range is always your set of outputs. What can actually come out of the function? Uh, and the domain is a set of inputs. So whether you call that uh, X or Y or Z or W, right? It doesn't so much matter. It's really what's coming out of your function. Good question. All right. Um, and just as kind of a reminder, if you are studying ranges and you want to uh, get more practice, I, I had, and I think it's in our pre-class uh, video playlist there on YouTube, there was an additional entire video dedicated to ranges. And I think it's like 15 or 20 minutes. So um, you do have that at your disposal as well. All right, moving on, another problem from 14.1. Uh, a topic that we covered then was about contour plots. Uh, these are also referred to as level curves. So we have a picture here, and I'm interested which of these functions could create this contour plot or the set of level curves. And of course, right, we're kind of kind of go through here and do a little bit of elimination. Um, contour plots or level curves were all the places where we had some set output for our function. So usually we replaced our output, in this case, a Z value with some fixed K, right? And we thought about maybe if K equals zero or K equals one or K equals five or what have you, right? K could be really most constants. Um, so for part A, right, if I replace this Z with a K, some constant, and you can think of K equaling one or zero or five or what have you, right? If I rearrange this, I can get Y equals X cubed plus K. So that means if I was to think about all the different level curves, for instance, when k equals zero, I'm just going to get my good old classic cubic equation, right? But if k was equal to one, right, that plus k is going to be shifting it up by one, right? So we'd get something a little bit higher. I mean, it would still be a cubic, but it'd be a little bit higher. And so we can see very quickly that a will not generate this, right? We don't have any circles whatsoever. And so A is out. And we can kind of go down the list, right? I could next look at B for a little while, right? And I could think about if I had K is equal to Y secant of X. And just like before, right? Quite often when I'm graphing things, I like to solve Y equals because that's what we've been trained, right? We know how to visualize quite often when you have Y equals. And so for a lot of functions, I solve Y equals. And so I'd like to kind of get the secant onto the other side. Well, of course, if I want to get the secant onto the other side, I could divide by secant. But remember, secant is already a reciprocal function in its own right, right? Secant is one divided by cosine as is. And so if I wanted to get uh, you know, this to the other side, really it'd probably be better, more clear, and I'm better at graphing cosine than I am one over secant, right? One over secant would be kind of confusing, but if I write it in terms of sines and cosines, right, I, I know what cosine looks like. And so for B here, right, depending on what your K value is, right, if K equals zero, for instance, it's zero times anything is zero. You're just going to have Y equals zero in that case. If K equals one, you're going to have your good old classic one cosine of X. You're going to get kind of this classic cosine function. And really, this is probably enough. But if you wanted to draw another one for K equals two, right, things are stretched out a little bit more. But either way, right, you're not making circles. And so, OK, B is out. C, you do finally make circles. So at least we, we stand a chance for this one. Can anyone tell me C is not the correct answer uh, and we'll need to eliminate it? How can we see that C is not correct in our case? Uh, uh, right here. Exactly. So if we do K is equal to X squared plus Y squared, these are concentric circles, right, where the origin, right, is always the center, right? So this K is acting as the radius or really the the square root of the radius, I suppose, or whatnot. But right, these are all going to be circles centered at the origin. But we have circles that are somehow moving up and down, right? The centers are changing a little bit, right? So for instance, for this circle right here, this is not centered at the origin. It's centered a bit higher. So we need something where our, at least, it, the centers don't seem to be moving left and right at all. But they do seem to be changing the y values. 
So yeah, C is out for this reason here. So now at this point, we have kind of two options. We could work on eliminating E, right? Uh, and we see with these exponentials and whatnot that it's probably uh, not so unreasonable that this is not creating circles. And so we could eliminate E, or we can kind of talk about why D uh, is going to be the, the correct answer. So um, let's, you know, I'll let you eliminate E if you wanted to on your own, but let's go ahead and just show that for D that this is a reasonable uh, answer here. And so, first of all, why don't I say I, I don't really like, you know, my, my fractions here. I'm going to rearrange this a little bit. I'm going to make it oh, like this. Y divided by K. And so we can see that we're kind of getting circles, but typically, right, when I have some Y value like this, um, right, we would probably want to get all of our variables on one side. And then back in 12.1, now it seems like forever ago, we quite often would complete the square, right? So we would complete the square. I mean, this isn't something I'm, Right, depending on what k is, k could be one, that's relatively nice. k could be equals to two, that's not so bad, right? But we would complete the square, but this is gonna offset our center, right? And so depending on what our k is, this is offsetting our center so much, right? Uh, and whatever value we add there is also gonna be affecting the radius. So maybe at this point, right, you're completely happy that this is gonna be circles, but you now have offset your y value for your center and changed the radius, right? So the answer will be D, and we can see that this is offsetting our center, the Y value for our center and changing our radius. Of course, if you wanted to be very explicit about this, right, you could choose some K values, right? So if I did K equals one, X squared plus Y squared minus Y. Remember in order to complete the square, we uh, took our B value, we divided it by two and squared it. So in this case, it's gonna be plus one fourth on each side. And then if we factored, this would be my y minus a half times y minus a half, or aka we did successfully complete the square. Uh, one fourth, by the way, is the same thing as one half squared. So if you're looking for what your radius is. So now this is a circle. The center is zero one half, and the radius is one half. So it would be, I don't know, maybe something like this here. Zero, one half, and our center is one half, right? This doesn't have scales. I don't have tick marks for X's and Y's, so I don't know for sure which one it is, but it's at least a circle that's been shifted in the Y direction. All right, so that's a, a little bit of a review about contour plots or level curves. Uh, yeah, question. Does, sorry, this equation equal for half of the circles? Or? Uh huh. Ah, so if you wanted to get the circles below, you'd probably need negative k values. So if you did a negative uh, one, negative five, whatever, stuff like this, uh, I, you could get the, the circles below. Yeah. Good. Um, oh, uh, I guess I'll give everyone else a chance. Any other questions about number two? All right. So then, why don't we go ahead and move on to number three, the final topic from 14.1. You'll notice here, right, and I'll continue to put the section numbers and stuff like this if you want to go out and practice similar problems, right, where you can find such things. Um, but the uh, kind of my review, I'm waiting more towards the, the earlier stuff just because it's been a while, right? So you'll notice that I don't even think I have a 16.3 problem on here because, well, we just did that Monday. So maybe you don't need to review that as much as you do the earlier stuff. So um, anyway, uh, the final type of 14.1 problem was about domains. So in domains, you're interested in what are your inputs that keep you in the reals? 
And so, uh, again, we're not doing complex calculus, thank goodness. We would like to have real valued calculus. And so in that case, right, we're looking for really three things that break our algebra back from our algebra days. We don't like to divide by zero. That would be a problem. We don't like putting negatives into square roots or really any even roots. And we don't like putting negatives or zeros and stuff like this into logarithms. So those are usually the big three to look out for. In this case, we don't have any division. We don't have any logarithms, but I do have some square roots. So I need to make sure that what I'm inputting into these things are not negative, AKA they're positive or zero. So the first thing that I'm inputting into a square root is negative x. I want to make sure that that's greater than or equal to zero. The other thing that I'm inputting into a square root is this 9 minus x squared minus y squared, and I want to make sure that it's also greater than or equal to zero. If either of one of these fails, right, let's suppose that the first one makes sense and the second one doesn't. Let's say the first one equals 5 and the second one is undefined. Then what is 5 plus undefined? Who knows, right? It's still undefined. So you really need both of these to be real valued numbers. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense to add them together. And so that's why I use and, right? You have to have both of these things being true. If either one fails, it's not in the domain. So, all right, the first one here is saying that x should be less than or equal to 0, right? So remember, when you multiply by negative 1, this is one of the few things that flips your inequality. The second one here, probably the best thing that I can write, is that x squared plus y squared should be less than or equal to 9. So in my first case, x less than or equal to 0 is all the stuff over here. Again, these are inputs, inputs x, y values. So that's why I draw the x, y plane. All of the x stuff that's less than or equal to 0 is to the left. It does go up to and is equal to zero. So if you wanted to be very explicit about this, right? Okay, nice solid line here. Okay, for this one here, well, when this is equal to nine, this is a circle of radius three. And we want our x squared plus y squared to be less than or equal to nine. You can probably guess that this is gonna be inside of our circle of radius three. But again, you can do test points if you're ever hesitant or right, you can do a test point and see is the inside of the circle the thing that we should say shade or is the outside. When you choose a test point on the inside, for instance, zero, zero, you'll see that nine is greater than or equal to zero squared plus zero squared. This is a true statement. If you choose something on the outside of the circle, for instance, negative four, zero, and you do nine is less than or equal to 16 plus zero, right? Negative four squared, 16, right? This is not a true statement. So you should not shade the outside, you should shade the inside. If we want both of these things to be true, well, that means we need to be on the left half and inside of our circle. So when I think about these and, you know, um, you can maybe even, uh, one nice way is to shade these in like different colors or something like this. So you could say, here's the left half. And I want to stay inside of this circle. Where both of these things are true. Now you can kind of clearly see, hopefully red and blue sort of makes purple there. Um, and so, yes, we're just going to be in the left half of our circle. That would be our sketch. Of course, a little bit better if you wanted to put it in the radius or something like this. Circle of radius three, there we are. We also saw in class that we can write this in set notation. So these are the x, y values in the real plane such that uh, x is less than or equal to zero and x squared plus y squared is less than or equal to 9. So again, for set notation, oops, forgot the r squared. You write, where do your elements of your set live? In this case, they live in the xy plane, r squared. Uh, and what conditions must they satisfy? 
So really, it's just going back to those two equations that we found by making sure that uh, we're not putting negatives into our square roots. Of course, in our web work homeworks and stuff like this, we saw a lot more of this first type, right? And uh, historically, I've seen a lot more of these kind of on quizzes and exams and stuff as well. We're sketching the domain either with a multiple choice, right? I could make you match just like we did in web work with a, some pictures, right? Or certainly if this was a free response style question, you could draw that. All right, any questions on number three here? All right, finally something not 14.1. We have a function here. I've gone ahead and given you the partial derivatives, and I would like to find and classify local extrema. So this comes from 14.7. In 14.7, there were two flavors of problems, really. There were local mins and maxes, and there were absolute mins and maxes. Uh, the absolute mins and maxes are long problems, typically. As we saw, you have to check the boundary, each boundary curve. You have to check the endpoints, all that sort of stuff, as well as finding your uh, critical points. For the local mins and maxes, it's a, a little bit faster, I find. The other nice thing about this is with the formula sheet, right? The second derivative test for local mins and maxes is on our formula sheet. And so that's another good thing. Make sure that you have the formula sheet printed out. You're carrying it around with you between now and tomorrow, and you know exactly what's on there and what's not on there. So, okay, really for these ones, there's always these two steps, find the critical points, classify the critical points. So in finding the critical points, right, we're very interested about when our derivatives are zero or undefined. In our class, I don't even think we've seen an undefined case, unless we did like a, a specific project or something like this. So uh, really these are largely coming down to just when our um, first derivatives are equal to zero. And so in our case, we have, one minus x y e to the y minus x. When does that equal zero? That's my x derivative. And my y derivative is one plus y x e to the y minus x. When does that equal zero? And so let's maybe explore this first one here. When you have a product of things equaling zero, if any one of those things in the product is zero, well, zero times anything is zero. So, right, you could have one minus x equaling zero, and that would do it. Or you could have y equals zero, and that would do it. Or you could have e to the y minus x equals zero, and that would do it, right? If any one of these things was equal to zero, that would give you a zero overall. So, in our first case, we have x equals one as a possibility. y equals zero is already solved for y. The only one that's a little bit confusing here is this E one. If I wanted to try to solve for like Y equals, or I guess I could do X equals, my very first step is to apply a logarithm. When you apply a logarithm, well, you have to do it on both sides. And on the right-hand side, you would be taking the log of zero. And you punch that into your calculator to get the answer. And it says, error, right, undefined. So. Uh, in this case, there are no additional solutions that come from this, e to the y minus x equals zero. The other thing that you can do in order to verify this is that you can just kind of sketch, right, and think about this graphically. E's being exponentials, right, uh, raised to who cares what the power is. I'm going to put a u there just for simplicity for the time being, right? But E's look like this, right? They have an asymptote. They do get very, very close to zero, way off to the left, but they never actually hit zero. So no matter how hard you try, right, you're never actually hitting zero with an exponential. And that's what the error in your calculator is telling you, right? That there's no place where this crosses. Error, I can't find an answer, right? So this doesn't yield any additional things here. All right, so that's what it takes in order for our x derivative to be equal to zero. For our y derivative to be equal to zero, right, we could have y is equal to negative one, or we could have x is equal to zero, or we could have this e to the y minus x equals zero, and we already saw that that doesn't happen ever. So really our only hope for finding critical points is if uh, y is equal to negative one or x is equal to zero. 
So now we want all kind of combinations here that uh, would work out, right? We're, we want to, critical points that should be where your x derivative and your y derivative are both equal to zero. And so if you start just taking, you know, kind of combinations of these things, you know, x equals one, y equals negative one, x equals zero, y equals zero. And then you could do something maybe like x equals zero and negative one there. And you could do x equals one and y equals zero. Two of these are true and two of these are false. But I see this mistake come up. And so that's why I wanted to bring it up in class. Two of these are actual critical points and two of them are not. Can someone maybe identify for me a point here that is not a critical point? Which one don't you like on my list? Uh, in the back here? Zero, zero. Why don't you like zero, zero? Oh, you're already classifying. I'm just finding. <laughs> but yeah, so maybe it would be hard to classify. We'd have to check on this later. But in the category of just finding, zero, zero is not too bad, right? So when x is equal to zero, I know that my y derivative is zero. And when y is equal to zero, I know that my x derivative is equal to zero. So I, I do know that both my x derivative is zero and my y derivative is zero. And so therefore, it's a critical point. So I am happy with zero, zero, but we will have to kind of get into the classifying here in just a second about maybe it won't be so nice to classify. Anyone have another guess uh, here? One negative one. So let's check here. Again, the big thing for critical points is that you need to have both your x derivative being zero and your y derivative being zero. They both need to be zero, otherwise you don't have a critical point. So in our case, if x is equal to one, that gives us that our x derivative is equal to zero. If y is equal to negative one, right? So that was one negative one, right? Our y derivative is equal to zero. So we do have our x derivative being zero and our y derivative being zero. So actually I like it. I do like one negative one. So let me show you though, if we were to do zero negative one, zero negative one, in this case, we would have x equals zero means that our y derivative is equal to zero. y equaling negative means that our y derivative is equal to zero. But we don't have anything that's helping us make our x derivative equal to zero. So our x derivative, again, you can kind of go back to this. Our x derivative, if um, x equals zero, we would have one minus zero. If y is equal to negative one, we would have a negative one here. And then we'd have e to the negative one minus zero. So that means that our um, x derivative here would be negative one times e, that's not zero. And so you do have to be a little bit careful about um, making sure that both your x derivative is equal to zero and our y derivative is equal to zero. And so this one doesn't work and one zero, right? If x is equal to one and y is equal to zero, that's just giving us that our x derivatives are equal to zero. It doesn't actually, solve any of our conditions for our y derivatives equaling zero. And so those two ones here are out. So I have my critical points, and now we need to get into the classifying. So classifying our critical points, this is where we use this D thing. So let's maybe start off at zero, zero. And again, this is on our formula sheet. So we need to take our f sub x, x times our f sub y, y minus our f sub x, y quantity squared. And I'm gonna try to plug in zero, zero, zero everywhere I see an x, zero everywhere I see a y for this. So f sub x, x, if I plug in zero for y, well, that means that's gonna be zero. I don't particularly care now what f sub y, y is. F sub x, y, looking over here, if I plug in zero for x and zero for y, that's gonna be one times one times e to the zero, which is also happens to be one. And so this ends up being uh, zero minus one squared. So that's equal to negative one, which is of course a negative answer. And so we know zero, zero is a saddle point. On the other hand, 
if I plug in one negative one, again, into this determinant equation here. Try my best, going back up to my uh, double x derivative. One for x, negative one for y, uh, and this would be what e to the negative two, I suppose. So that's my uh, double x derivative here. Let's do our y derivatives, f sub y, y. Again, we're plugging in uh, what? Negative one for y, one for x, and then this is going to be the same thing here, e to the y minus x, so negative one minus one, e to the negative second power. And then we need to subtract away f sub x, y. So if I plug in one for x here, that's going to be zero. And then I really don't care about the rest because zero times anything is zero. So this ends up being, let's see, I have two negative ones. So that's going to be positive one. So I have e to the negative second times e to the negative second. Uh, if you'd like to, you can simplify that down to e to the negative fourth. Those would add together. And if you're at all hesitant about this, you plug it into your calculator and you get the decimal. And it'll verify for sure that this is a positive answer. Again, exponentials are only ever going to be outputting positives. If I were to look at my picture here, I'd be plugging in around negative four, right? Still positive. So the output here, e to the negative four, is some positive answer. It never hits zero or less than that. But just plug that into your calculator. It verifies that it's positive. So now this is either going to be a local min or a local max, and it's all going to depend on what f sub x, x is. Uh, well, we already did that, right? And we found that that's equal to x to the negative 2. That's also positive, so that means it's concave up. Or you just, again, look at your formula sheet, and it'll tell you that, well, this is going to be a local minimum. So what? Uh, this point was 1, negative 1 is a local min. Oof. All right, any questions on this one here? Yes, here in the middle. Yep. So yeah, uh, if D is equal to zero, then the second derivative test is inconclusive. So it, it's not that it's um, not you know a minimum or that it's not a maximum or anything like this, is that the second derivative test doesn't know. So the second derivative test that we have here is not all powerful, that there are other techniques that you may need to use in order to solve sufficiently complicated problems. Of course, uh, in our class for a timed quiz or an exam or things like this, if we're you know, asking you to classify, this is the only method that we know in our class. Uh, and so problems that we give you are very, very likely to have uh, you know, D not be zero. But I could give you a, um, you know, maybe true false style problem or something like this and claim that some point is a maximum, right? And, you know, D could be equal to zero in that case and, and you get a false answer sort of deal. Or the, you know, the derivative, second derivative test claims that um, one negative one or something like this is a local min, but if D was equal to zero for that problem, right, you would say false, right? So I guess that you, you could make a, like a, a simplish true false style question, but we don't know how to classify that in our class um, uh, without the second derivative test. Good, good question. Um, all right, well, why don't we go ahead and move on to number five here. Consider our surface, find the equation of the tangent plane to our surface through this point. This one, uh, well, this one is a fine review question. And I, I like it for the review question, that's why I put it on here. Uh, it's a bad, exam question, uh, just because there's multiple good paths to take in order to solve this. Uh, and so one good path that you could do, I, I guess maybe before I get into those paths, ultimately what we're aiming for is a tangent plane. 
we know back from uh, earlier in the semester, if you want an equation of a tangent plane, you need a point that the plane goes through, and you need a normal vector. The point that this goes through, well, we can get that actually quite quickly, uh, thanks to the fact that we have the point in rho phi theta, right? We can just transform this. On the formula sheet, we have the conversion equations that go from spherical, rows and phi's and theta sort of deal, into x's and y's and z's. So we can get our point that the plane goes through quite quickly. X naught, Y naught, Z naught. We'll do that here in just a second. The other piece for our tangent plane is that we need to know a normal vector. So there are two ways that we could do this. If we think about this as a 16.6 .6 style question, we could come up with a parameterization for this and then find the normal vector as the cross product of tangent vectors. So this was something that we did a fair amount in 16.6. .6. The other thing that we could do is that we could try to get our spherical equation into Cartesian, x's, y's, and z's. And then we saw a similar sort of problem where we were coming up with tangent planes by using gradient vectors, right? The gradient is supposed to be normal or perpendicular uh, to our, our surface. And so we could come up with a gradient vector, and then that would be more of a 14.6 style question. So these are the two legitimate uh, paths in order to solve this. Uh, and that's why I say that maybe it wouldn't make a, as good of an exam question as it would for review, because right review, we were kind of interested in either one of these. Um, it turns out this 14.6 method is a bit faster. So maybe that's the one that we can demonstrate here in class. Uh, but I do invite you that, you know, maybe afterwards or whatnot that to practice, maybe try the 16.6 uh, .6 method where you parameterize uh, instead. All right. So again, we're going to be following this method here uh, in order to come up with our equation. So let's first uh, figure out this x naught, y naught, z naught business, right? So we know our point of interest has rho equals 2, phi equals pi over 3, and theta equals pi. Oops, theta equals pi. And I want to know, what does that correspond to with x's, y's, and z's? What's our point of interest but in Cartesian? And so if we go back to our formula sheet, right, it'll tell us things like x is equal to rho sine phi cosine theta. And y is equal to rho sine phi sine theta. And z is equal to rho cosine phi. And so if we go ahead and we plug in these values, Rho is equal to 2. Uh, phi is equal to pi over 3. So sine of pi over 3 would be root 3 over 2. Cosine of pi is negative 1. So this is going to be equal to negative root 3. That's my x naught. That's my x point of interest here. For the y's, right, we would have 2 and we'd have the root 3 over 2 again. But then sine of pi, sine of pi is 0. So that's just going to be equal to 0. And then finally, for my z's, we have rho cosine phi. Phi was pi over 3. So cosine of pi over 3, our calculators will verify for us that that's 1 half. And so we get 1. So already I know, and you know, if this was a uh, standard response style question, which is a longer one, so I would hope that it would be, right? we already know uh, some information that we could plug in in hopes of getting some partial credit. So I know my x naught, my y naught, my z naught, my, my point of interest, right, for x's, y's, and z's. All right. So if we're aiming for a 14.6 style solve for this one, I would love to be able to get my equation into Cartesian. So I have rho equals 4 cosine phi. So this is the bit, uh, and we practiced this, you know, when we were talking about uh, in 16.6 .6 and even before that, um, right? We would try to match up the equations that we have with what we're given. And so in particular, the only one that has cosine of phi in it, we actually saw this right above here, is the z equation. Z has a cosine of phi. 
But the only problem is in order to use the Z equation, right, there needs to be a row in front of that. So therefore, I become very interested in what if I could get a row right here? In that case, this would be equal to 4z. And I'd be well on my way to making this a Cartesian equation, x's, y's, and z's. Now, of course, if you would like to make a row appear on the right-hand side, you have ruined your equal sign, unless you also do it on the left. So this is going to be row times row, or row squared, on the left. And now our equal sign is saved, because we've done the same thing on both sides, multiplied by row. And luckily, even though I wasn't particularly trying for it, on our formula sheet, right, we do know that row squared is x squared plus y squared plus z squared. So now, in order to find a normal vector, right, thinking about in the 14.6 style, we need to have all of our variables on one side and a constant on the other side. So I'm going to go ahead and write this as x squared plus y squared plus z squared minus 4z equals 0. And this right here becomes my function, my f, that I'm going to be taking the gradient of. Maybe I'll use lowercase f just because now capital F recently we've been using a lot for vector fields. This isn't a vector field. It's just a scalar function. So I'll use little f. So now let's find a gradient. Gradients are supposed to be normal to our surface. So that's why I'm interested in this, because remember, looking for a normal vector here. So partial derivative with respect to x, partial derivative with respect to y, partial derivative with respect to z. This will give us normal vectors all around the surface. We're really only interested in our normal vector at one particular point, right? Our point of interest here. And so I'm going to go ahead and plug in my, what, x equals negative root 3, y equals 0, z equals 1. So that's going to be my normal vector at the point that I'm interested in. So in this case, I get negative 2 root 3. 2 times 0 is 0. And when I plug in 1 for z, I get negative 2. So my final answer would be negative 2 root 3 times x minus x naught plus 0 times, who cares really, and then minus 2 times z minus 1 equals 0. So again, I'm just going back to my um, tangent plane equation, and now I'm plugging in my normal vector. My normal vector, negative 2 root 3, 0 negative two. That right there would be my final answer. Questions on this one here? Yeah, in the back. Yeah, so I don't know if my words will be any different than what I said it the first time through, so I apologize that I'll give kind of uh, the same explanation and hope for uh, different results. But again, my goal here, when I, and you have to imagine that right, you have the formula sheet in front of you. You're trying to match the formulas on the formula sheet to help you convert into Cartesian, right? So we know the end result what it looks like in terms of x's, y's, and z's. Now, on the formula sheet, right, you'll see kind of these three equations, for instance, and you'll also see the x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals rho squared. And so for the equation that I have, I notice that I have a cosine of phi. And when I look for cosine of phi's, the only one that appears is in my z. Notice you have sine of phi, sine of phi for x's and y's. So my only hope, really, of getting rid of this cosine of phi is if I can somehow make this line up and be uh, my z equation. And to that end, right, I'm very interested in making a row appear here because then my z equation is satisfied, right? Rho cosine phi is equal to z. So that's why I try to make a row appear on the right-hand side. Of course, if I make a row appear on the right-hand side, technically I'm multiplying it, right? 
that would ruin my equal sign unless if I also do the same thing on the left-hand side. So that's why the row becomes row squared because I need to multiply by a row on both the right and on the left. That help at all. Super. <laughs> Good. All right. Um, so do, 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 do. that's the end of this one. With uh, five minutes left, um, I think, so if I have to miss something in class, so I'll tell you right that um, finding mass from density, this is something that, that we did with line integrals. This was the line integrals with a scalar function from 16.2. And I'll post a solution to this after class. Finding work, this was the other type of line integral that we did in 16.2. This was the f dot t ds, or if you like the working definition as I do, f dot r prime of t dt. That helps you find work. But uh, I know from students you know, telling me and whatnot that uh, folks sometimes struggle with true-false questions. And so I think maybe the remaining four minutes or so that we have in class, why don't we look at a few true-false questions uh, and talk about those together um, uh, with what time we have. So the first one here is talking about a closed set, right? So first of all, we need to remember, right, the definition of a closed set. Closed sets came from 14.7 largely. They were the condition for the extreme value theorem. And largely what a closed set needs is that it should have all of its boundary points. And that is when you go and you draw it, you shouldn't use any dashed lines, right? It should be all solid lines because the solid lines means that we're including the boundary. The dashed lines mean that we're excluding the boundary. So all boundary points, or that is when you draw it, right, you should have all solid lines. So if you were to think about this, right, there's really, there's two things that are going on. First of all, we're talking about a domain. You want to make sure that what you plug into your square root should be greater than or equal to zero. If you don't do that, right, then you've ruined the square root and you're not getting real answers. But this one also has division, right? And so if you were to look at the division, this is saying that, well, we shouldn't divide by zero. So whatever we're dividing by, that should not be equal to zero. So our first thing here says that we should be inside of a circle of radius two, up to and including the boundary, right? This is less than or equals to, x squared plus y squared less than or equal to four, right? So that equals to means that we're going up to and including the boundary. So you'd hope maybe, ah, closed. But the second one here, this, if we square both sides and then rearrange a little bit, right? Squaring both sides, squaring zero doesn't do a whole lot. Rearrange a little bit. This says that x squared plus y squared should not be equal to four. Otherwise, you'll be dividing by zero. So the square root doesn't really mind. Square root of zero is zero. It's happy with that. But the fact that it's in the denominator, that's the problem, right? Now you're dividing by zero. So really, these two things together say that x squared plus y squared should be less than four. So that means you can go up to a radius of two, but you shouldn't actually equal the radius of two. So this right here is going to be an open set. It, has, it doesn't include any of its boundary points. And so the answer here will be false. The next problem here talks about the wave equation. The wave equation went something like this. Remember on the knowledge checklist, you should know about harmonic functions or the Laplace equation along with the wave equation. I see lots of cosines and sines, so I'm kind of hopeful maybe that it would satisfy the wave equation. Uh, it turns out that this one does not. So if you take some partial derivatives with respect to x, you get negative sine of x. Two derivatives would be negative cosine of x. If you take derivatives with respect to t, your first derivative here is gonna be cosine of t. And your second derivative with respect to t is going to be negative sine of t. There's no constant that makes uh, this equation hold true. So there's no c value for which uh, f sub xx 
is equal to c squared times f sub tt. I'm blanking right now. I, I don't remember in class if we use c squared or if we use a squared. If we use a squared, okay, fine. Make it an a. Uh, maybe one more, and I apologize for going at, over. Um, directional derivative. As we know, directional derivatives are calculated out with dot products. We need to make sure that we have a unit vector, and then we're dot producting this with the gradient. And so the um, condition here is that it's going, uh, right, it's equal to the magnitude of the gradient. Uh, and the question is, are these two things parallel or not? Um, and so if we look at the um, kind of breaking down our dot product, as we know from 12.3, this would be equal to the magnitude of the first times the magnitude of the second oops, times the cosine of the angle between them. And the, and the claim is that this is equal to the magnitude of our gradient. Well, this is a unit vector. So we know its magnitude is going to be one. So the angle between these things, after all, that's what we're interested in for parallel. The angle between these things, right, that this cosine of theta needs to be equal to one, essentially. That's going to happen if theta is equal to zero or 180 degrees or pi radians, in which case it's going in the opposite direction, but it's still parallel. This one ends up being true. So just because the only places where cosine is equal to one, right, if you were to cancel out these on both sides now, uh, is where theta is equal to uh, zero or two pi and things like this. So, all right, well, that's uh, maybe a fine place to stop. I will post the answers to the other ones here uh, as well. I apologize for going out over, um, but yeah, I just wanted to make sure you saw a few true false questions just because I know folks have told me that uh, these sometimes are, are quite complicated. So I will stick around if there are any one-on-one -on -one questions. Otherwise, uh, I wish you all the best of luck with the remaining of your studying and of course on the exam tomorrow. So uh, again, make sure you plug, you know, in your, a calendar and an alarm or whatnot that you make sure you take the exam between seven and nine, uh, all that good stuff. Don't forget about it by any means. So, all right. Thanks everyone.